For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Sundays were in 1 Timothy 4. We stopped there. Wanted to talk about we're in the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 10. And while we were there, we focused on the word godliness, eusepia. You remember that, of course, out of 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And when he talks about godliness is profitable for all things, in verse 8, since it holds promise for the present life, Christian life, and for the life to come. So I felt like this was an important doctrine, and so I stopped to do a couple of studies from it. And so let's go to Second Peter for our text today, talking about godliness. Uh, we talked about it last week. We're back to it. I'm in verse 3 of the first chapter, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 7. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. See, Paul said the same thing over in Timothy. Through the true knowledge or the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he's granted to us, notice he's used this word granted, ditto me twice, the word given. <coughs> he's used this twice. That's a point one and a point two for, for Paul and Peter. Uh, Peter. This for Peter is point one, point two. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature that's, that's godliness in the flesh. Godliness in our humanity is the divine nature operating in the Christian life through the promises, the exhaling of the truth of the word of God. Having become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the pollution that is in the, uh, the corruption that is in the world by lust, now by these very reasons also, supplying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence, knowledge, in your knowledge, self-control, in your self-control, perseverance, in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly love, in your brotherly love, in your brotherly kindness, love. Then he says, if these qualities, and he mentioned eight, and they're in the order of sequence of important to development. In other words, faith is number one, and then number two, number three, number four, till we get to number eight, love. He says, for if these qualities, virtues, for if these virtues are yours and are increasing. This is a very important principle. They render you neither, neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge, full knowledge, that's epinosis, of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, having forgotten the purification of his former sins. He's lost sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ that brought him into this wonderful life. He's lost sight that Jesus went to the cross and died, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. If these eight qualities are not manifested through the divine nature of a believer, it shows that he's not taking the Christian life as serious as God intends it to be taken. If these qualities are not present in your life, You've become short-sighted. You've become blind and short-sighted. You have a real spiritual eye problem. So, 
Here's what we know so far about godliness. Here's what we have learned so far. Paul has told us in Timothy that it's profitable for all things of the present life and the future life. Now stop and think about that. Godliness. Most people in the church don't have a clue about it. And yet it's one of the major key doctrines of the church. It's right up there with any other doctrine. It's up there with faith and hope and love and all these other. Perseverance, suffering. It is a major doctrine in the church. It's profitable for all things for the present life, the Christian life on earth and in heaven. Godliness is beneficial to the Christian life in time and eternity. Godliness. Last week we talked about godliness as a basic doctrine. The moment you get saved, you are moved, for, you, if you remember from last week, the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and raised from the dead, that's the gospel. The moment you believe that, Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says you are transferred from a position in Adam to a position in Christ. In Adam, you're under 13 judicial charges. One of those uh, uh, charges is ungodly. You are ungodly, not because of your behavior, because of your position in Adam. Romans, uh, Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man Adam, sin entered to the world, and death by sin. Spiritual death is one of those 13 judicial charges. Alienated from God, blind, cursed, condemned, uh, spiritually dead, um, in spiritual darkness, at enmity with God, the natural man perishing, ungodly, sinner, unrighteous, under the wrath of God. These are 13 judicial charges. Got nothing. That you're born into this state before God. If it, and that's what Paul talks about in Romans 5. Now, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're moved from a position in Adam to a position in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam all, all are dead. In Christ are all are made alive. See, there's a change, right? Dead in Adam, alive in Christ. That's spiritual. That's true with all these 13 judicial charges. We're benefited by faith in God. Now, one of them, one of the 13, is ungodly. You're in a position, as an unbeliever, you're in a position, not experientially, positionally, you're an ungodly. The moment you believe the gospel, you're transferred from being ungodly to godly. Now you're godly. That's a position in Christ. In Christ, you are godly. God always sees you in his son because of your salvation. He always sees you as godly. There are never in a time when God does not see you as godly because of what Christ did for the cross that you've accepted. That's godly. Godliness is the manifestation of godly out of your Christian life. Godliness is that godly, that godly work of God in you, that godly work of God in you being manifested through your flesh as a believer in Christ. That's godliness. That's experiential. That's experiential truth. Now we saw, so we studied that last week. For those who are on the internet, pick it up. Now, the other thing that we saw was found in 1 Timothy 3.16. In 1 Timothy 3.16, if you recall from last week, Paul said that godliness was a great, a great mystery doctrine of the church. He called it a great mystery doctrine of the church. Here's what he did. And he said godliness is. Here's what he did. When you read 1 Timothy 3.16, it's front, center, and back of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 
But we know, listen to me now, we know that the incarnation of Jesus Christ, in other words, born of the Virgin Mary, living his life, dying on a cross, ascending back to the Father, into the church age, waiting for him to come back, called the rapture. Okay? Now listen. We know that the incarnation of Jesus Christ was not a mystery doctrine. Jesus in the flesh was called God in the flesh. He was called Emmanuel, God with us. Come on now. That's the Christmas story of Christ. So we know that, the, that Christ coming in the flesh as God, God manifesting himself in incarnate, God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ is not the mystery. No, no. Mm. Because the mystery means that wasn't known previously. Something revealed unique to the church. Yet Paul says godliness is unique to the church. It's a mystery doctrine, a, a great, a major mystery doctrine of the church that is attached to the first coming of Christ. So what, what is that? Well, here we go. Let's, let's hold your place where you are in, in 2 Peter 1. That's where you should be. Let's go to the book of Colossians. Backing up through Timothy. Uh, Philippians. Colossians. What is the mystery of godliness attached to the first coming of Christ where he's called God with us? Emmanuel. God with us. What is that? He says, well, it's the, the mystery doctrine is godliness. What does that mean? What does that mean? Here's what it means. Here's what it means. Colossians 1.27, verse 26. This is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to the saints, church age believers, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what that mystery is connected to the first coming of Christ? Christ indwelling Gentiles. God the Son indwelling the bodies. First Corinthians 6, 19. What, don't you know that your body became the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there? Don't you know your body's the temple of God, the naos? When he says temple, he means naos, which is the holies of holies, the place where God dwelt. Don't you know that when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, your body has been bought by Christ on the cross? You are no longer your own? You've been bought with a price? That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And the great mystery is that God dwells in you. God dwells inside you. The great mystery, listen, the great mystery is that God dwells inside us through the Holy Spirit. He dwells inside us whether we're Jews or Gentiles. Galatians 3.27 Neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, slave or free. That's because you're saved by grace through faith, and this is the church age. The great mystery of godliness attached to the incarnation of Christ is that God dwells inside our flesh once we're born again. We have a divine nature, and that divine nature is to reflect the divine God. We're to be godly people. We're to be godly people. We are not to be like the world. The world is ungodly. Even if they go to church, they're ungodly. We saw it last week with a guy called Cornelius, a devout unbeliever of the religion of Judaism. So you've, 
you've just got to understand that this, this idea of godliness, there's never been anything like this. Listen, godliness is attached to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When you're, a, when you're in Christ, you have this, you are godly positionally through salvation, and now you have that divine nature that is supposed to reflect godliness. And it's, listen, it's not the ministry of the flesh. It's not getting your flesh to behave. It's not your flesh getting to be religious. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Godliness. Godliness. You can see the danger of legalism. Legalism destroys the whole concept of godliness. They attach godliness to works. It's not. It's attached to Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. This is what Paul has in mind in Romans 8, 8, 8 29. He says... He says to the Christian, God foreknew you, he predestined you in order for you to be conformed to the image of his son. When you're born again, you have a divine nature, but it's a baby in Christ. It's a baby in Christ. And it needs milk, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For it to grow, it's got to have the milk of the doctrines of salvation under grace. And when it, when it assimilates that milk into his life, the doctrines of salvation, security, so that at a point you have faith in the word of God that you are saved forever, that you're not going to lose it, that Christ died one time for you to live forever for Christ, then you have entered into a state of spiritual maturity. Now you have the ability to form Christ in you. And you move in a state of, of what is called adulthood, teleos in the Greek. You now have a chance to become conformed to the image of Christ. The divine nature of God wants to birth out his son in you. You have the divine nature of God. You've been born again. You've been born again. You are a child of God. And as a child of God with a divine nature, he wants that divine nature to become the image of the Son. That's godliness at work. You are not going to get there. Listen to me. You are not going to get there. And it's one of the great things that you be, should be after. You, listen, Paul, uh, Peter says you should pursue it. You should pursue it. You should pursue it. Uh, Paul, actually, Paul said that. 1 Timothy 6.11. I looked on my paper. You should pursue. He says, Paul says in the 6th chapter of 1 Timothy, we'll get there one day, pursue it. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. These are the high virtues of the Christian life. These are the high virtues of the Christian life. Listen, it's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be able to be saved to reflect the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot do it apart from understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you and the word of God working in you. If you don't know how to walk in the spirit and walk by faith, you will never get here. And this is a goal. This is a high virtue of the Christian life. It is a high virtue. We should pursue godliness. You've never heard of it. Nobody has told you this. Nobody has brought this to your attention. Listen to me. That's why God drug you in here today. Like drag, not like drug. Like drag. Now, to get godliness where God wants it, to get godliness where your flesh 
has brought into the divine nature, not the human nature, has, divide, has left the world, uh, w the world of lust for pleasure, has brought into pleasing God rather than satisfying your flesh, has now brought into pleasing God, and you've tapped into your divine, na divine nature, which says walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, walk by faith and not by sight. When you do, then you are now, through the word of God, beginning to conform your divine nature into the image of Christ so that godliness can be manifested. Let me tell you something. Jesus at the age of 12 manifested godliness. When he was with the, with the, the pharisaical brain power of the day, the religious brain power, and stood and spoke on behalf of God and manifested godliness. Now his incarnation is coming to fruit. Is coming to fruit because it's reflecting God-likeness. And you can see it coming through the ministry of the Spirit and the ministry of the Word of God before it ever got into ministry out. This is the first introduction of godliness ministry and the influence it has upon other people. That's what I'm talking about today. This church is not a 10 percenter. The typical church that you go speak to, 10 percent of the people are going to listen to you. The other 90 percent don't. In this church, 90% are going to listen, and I got 10 who don't. Yeah? They're made to come. They don't want to come. They'd rather go do anything come church. But they've got some kind of swap-out deal going. They're never going to understand what I say. They just can't wait to get old enough or do whatever, uh, to do whatever they can do to get out of here. It's the worst mistake you could ever make in your life. To come to church and not pay attention. Listen, my job, that's not my job. My job is to teach those who are interested. I'm just saying to you, it doesn't take, doesn't take a whiz bang to look into your eyes and know that you'd rather be someplace else. All right? Doesn't take no whiz kid to do that. But I, it saddens me because you're missing why God brought you here. You're going to miss it. And this is a big doctrine. This is a biggie. And I don't want you to miss it. So I want you to pay attention. Godliness will never become manifested in your flesh where the divine nature is the Son of God and the Son of God is now manifesting himself to other people in your periphery. What Gary Horton calls his six feet. What you want is godliness, not just between you and God. You want the godliness that's between you and God to be manifested to everybody who steps into your periphery. Just like when they stepped into Jesus' periphery, they knew they were standing in the presence of God. Jesus said, if you've, if you've seen me, you've seen God. When people step into your periphery, if, you're, if your godliness is being manifested... They step into that periphery. You don't have to tell them that, like Jesus told them. They know it. They know they're in the presence of a godly person. They know it. You know why? Listen, I knew it better as an unbeliever than I do as a believer. Because I knew the unbelievers. I could look around a group of people I knew who were unbelievers. I could pick them out. I just had our time picking out the believers. You know why? Because I didn't see consistency. They talked to talk and wouldn't walk to walk. So I never knew where they were. The one thing about worldly, they walk the walk. They talk the world, they walk the world. Until they get religious. Now, once you reach spiritual maturity, that full nature of Christ is manifested in your life. You have a desire to walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You have a desire to walk by faith, not by sight. That is your modus operandi of the Christian life. 
You don't have to prime yourself. Well, I've got to really be spiritual today because I'm going to be with a group of spiritual people. I've got to be spiritual today because i got to sit in church for an hour. i really got to be spiritual today. You know, this is a natural fit. When you're a spiritual, mature believer, you have a desire to please God. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 6, you have a desire to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That you, you, you have bought into that concept a long time ago. This is not something you're working on. You're a spiritual mature believer. You don't get there unless you work on this. And so, here's what's the secret of godliness in your six feet of space. And that's what godliness is about. Influencing everybody who steps into your periphery of influence. And let me tell you, it does. Reaching and maintaining that level of spiritual growth is very important. You know, when you leave high school, if you go to college, you're going to have a shock. Because your hardest day in high school is the easiest day in college. <laughs> you wait till you get there. Your hardest day in high school is your easiest day in college. It was when I went. I don't know what kind of schools they got there anymore. Everywhere they just grade by throwing papers up and I don't know how all that works, but I tell you, I still believe that's true. I Man, I got a daughter who teaches college level. I know she's tough. You've got to reach and maintain. And when you reach and maintain this level of academia in Christ, walking in the power of the Spirit all the time, not just sometimes, not when you want to or when you got to be have I'm out in the public I've got to do the right things but when I'm not there I do the wrong things I can switch my pleasure hats that's not, that's not the Christian I'm talking about I'm talking about the Christian who has made up their mind they're going to live for Christ they're going to live for Christ when they reach and maintain that spiritual level of maturity, we call that super grace. Because God is going to manifest such enormous things through your life, you will not believe what he's able and capable of doing through you. Moses, he never understood what that life would be like when he was out in the desert learning this principle. But when he walked into Egypt and began to speak the word of God with a desire to please God and not himself, nor the Pharaoh, nor the people of Israel, and began to live that godly life out there, put God out there where he himself knew, there is no way I could do this, but I know God will do it, and therefore I'm trusting God to do it. That's godliness. And, and Moses, along with the people, saw God do such miraculous things within his six feet of sphere of influence. It was always within that six feet. It didn't matter if he's at the sea, uh, the Red Sea, it was still the influence of his six feet. Where he looked up to God and said, Do it. You see, we say I'm a believer. There's one thing to believe in the gospel. It's another thing to believe God in your daily life where you put your daily life right out there on the edge and you claim it for God. Claim it for God. You've never, you've never pushed your life out on the edge and just claimed it for God and only God could do it. You're missing. This is the whole Christian life. 
This is the dynamics of why we're Christ. This is why we're not influencing the world. We're not influ the church is not even influencing America. We live in our little comfort cave. Godliness is stepping out. It's trusting God to do everything that He's promised within your six feet of influence. And I promise you, your six feet will have influence. Read the people in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, that dared to believe. That dared to believe. David, when God was teaching in them this principle, when a bear stepped into his periphery, he reached way beyond himself into the dynamics of God. And God manifested himself in David's life and he killed the bear and the lion, Goliath. He did it within his six feet of influence. All right, is your six feet influencing anybody? I mean for the Lord. We just came out of a great camp. It's not hard to have an influence in your six feet in, the, in a camp, in a Christian camp. Everybody's got their six feet covered. 99.9. .9. It's when you go back out in the world that your six feet have influence and dynamics upon other people. And this is what changes people's lives and influence them to Christ. Paul, uh, I mean Peter, in 2 Peter, let's go back to 2 Peter, he mentions, I want you to do something for me on your piece of paper. Got a pencil? If you don't have one, there's one in the pew. Somewhere on that pew, there's a pencil. Here's what I want you to do. At the top of your paper, I want you to draw a circle. At the top of your paper, draw a circle. I want you to do this now. God wants you to see something. From 12 to 6, draw a line. You know, from 12 to 6, go co co you know, clockwise. From 12 to 6, draw a line. Draw a line straight down the middle of it. I mean, who's got to watch anymore? Right? Nobody's got to watch. I, I can't find it on my cell phone, Ron. I know. Draw a line down the middle. Then from 9 to 3, uh, the other way, draw a line through. I got four parts, right? I want eight. So draw a line down this way and a line down that way, and I got eight parts, right? Am I your teacher? Then why aren't you doing it? Why don't you think you're smarter? If I didn't think this was important, I wouldn't have told you to do it. I mean, you believe in a command center of authority? Then do it. Now, starting up here at the top, going clockwise, I want you to put one, two, three, and go through until you got eight coming back up to where one is. You should have eight. You got them? One, two, three. I want you to now write them in there, starting clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You got it? I'm going to show you why that's important. I'm going to show you why this is important. Now go to 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter, first chapter of 2 Peter. We got verse 5, 6, 7. He's going to list eight things. Listen, number one is faith. If you've got somewhere you can write that across from your, on your paper, the first one's faith. The second one's moral excellence. The third one is knowledge. The fourth one is self-control. I'm now in verse 6. Then perseverance. Godliness is number 6. I want you to circle it because we're going from top to bottom and we're going in the order that Peter said is vitally important. 
Then we have brotherly kindness and love. Love is the number, number eight, which is top. <clears throat> Look at this. Godliness is number six on the list. That's how big it is. The only two above it is brotherly love and God's love. Philadelphia and agape. The only two greater <clears throat> in the virtues of the Christian life than godliness, only two things are greater. Love your brother and love God. That's how big it is. And let me tell you, Peter and Paul are on the same page of importance. The only thing greater than godliness is God's system of love. i tell you how big it is. Let me show you something else that you can't see in the English. See the word supply? First, first verse, uh, first chapter. See in verse 5, in your faith supply. See the word supply? Let me tell you something that's important here because the English is not going to show it to you. But this is what's important about that word. This is under point number one. That word is a, well, it's under, under point two. That word, epikorigeo, is an aorist active imperative, second person plural. That imperative is a command. That aorist imperative is a hot to command. There's no stronger command. That's a command. For those who are in art and drama, this verse is for you. See the word in the Greek language? E-P-I. Now watch this. E-P-I-C-H-O-R-E-G-E-O. -E See that E-P-I in front of that's a preposition. This word of importance is C-H-O-R-E-G-E-O. -E Listen. That is the word chorus. Chorus. This is a word taken from Greek drama. We would say from Hollywood today. The chorus were the actors, the specific actors in a play. These eight virtues are the eight members of the chorus of a Greek drama play. This word supply is important because this word means that each actor or chorus member of the Greek drama is personally financed. He doesn't finance himself. It's financed by someone else. He is, he is a actor that's supported by grace. Somebody else picks up the tab so that he can focus on his part. This is right out of the Hollywood script of that first ancient of, of uh, Greek drama. And the way Peter set it up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, is not to tell you how many just was in the chorus, but to tell you what each chorus person did in the play. Number one, he manifested faith. Number six, godliness. Do you understand? Each had a role to play. Do you see that? In the Greek drama, when they would come out, they'd put a mask on. The mask, the mask would, would identify the type of person that they were going to, a sad face or a happy face or a mean face or, 
or whatever. All eight of these are in the virtue of the Christian life. There are times when faith is the role. The next time it's knowledge and until we go all the way around. You do know this, don't you? Look, there are times in your life when the key person the, in the drama, steps out number one is faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There are many times that faith is a major player. Sometimes two of them come out. Two of them come out. Sometimes three of them come out. At some point, all eight of them are going to be involved and interactive in this play. The Christian life is made up of these great virtues. The question is, do you ever see them at play in your life? Your life is the drama. Your life is the drama in the plan of God. Paul is saying, do you see godliness at work in your life? Do you see faith at work? Is it, is it living out the drama of your life? He talks about faith. He talks about moral excellence. He talks about knowledge, gnosis. He talks about self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly love, and the love of God. This is what Paul is after. And he does it, in our passage, he does it really neat. See the word granted? First, I mean, Second Peter 1, 3 through whatever, in verse 5, uh, or in verse 4, he says, for by these, and, and, he, and he's gone back in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us, and then verse 4, for by these he's granted to us, see the word is used twice. Granted, listen, and who has, and the word is given, ditto me is the word given. It is the word given. And notice I put it, I um, notice that it's a perfect tense. Look, at both times it's a perfect tense. It means completed in that past with the, with the results it remains completed forever. God has granted this. This is the reason the word is granted in the perfect tense rather than given because it's what God has promised you. The perfect tense means that somewhere in eternity past, God has established this, identified it in the promise of the word of God, and now it's ready for you to manifest it. And so he says, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. In other words, God has supplied all that's necessary for you to live a godly life. To have that great influence over that sex. And listen, you don't know what that sex feet, where that sex, what's, what goes through that sex feet. I mean, it could be a, it could be a, a, a ship. Woo! That was close. You have no idea what's going through there, but it, you don't, it doesn't matter because you're going to influence it with godliness. It comes through, you're going to stamp it, godly, it ships right out. See, that's what I'm after with you. Divine power. Seeing that his divine power has been granted, divine power has been granted pertaining to life and godliness. Then he comes back and he says, for by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of that divine nature. And then he gets into that divine nature. He goes now, he explodes into these eight virtues. You need to be aware of these eight virtues. These eight virtues, like when you learn the spirit-filled life, listen to me now. You remember when you learned the spirit-filled life? One of the first things you, somebody taught you were that the fruit, of, the fruit of the spirit is nine, right? 
And so you learned them, did you not? And how important is that? Because that's what God has promised you. If you will walk in the Spirit, I will produce that. These are manifestations in your life that you are walking in the Spirit. Because the world can't give you any of that stuff. God can give you peace when the world would give you trouble. All right. Now you understand that, don't you? That's what these eight virtues are for walking by faith. These eight virtues are as important to your life of faith. Walking by faith and not by sight. These eight virtues are as important to that. You ought to learn these eight. These are as important to this as walking in the Spirit. The nine vir virtues of walking in the Spirit. The nine virtues of walking in the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit, not by flesh. These are eight that are apropos for walking by faith, not by sight. And you need to tap into these because these are important because now you're in a stage of spiritual growth maturity. And this is what dominates your life. Like over here, this is what dominates the spiritual life. I mean, you'll never go over there. Listen to me, I know you'll never go over there until you conquer these nine over here, until you begin to walk in the Spirit and see the Holy Spirit do supernatural things in your life when He says He can produce love, but, but you want to hate. We can produce, you know what I'm saying? Peace, and, and you're in anxiety, right? Then you see, you begin to understand the dynamics of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, right? Listen, if you never see it, you're not going to buy it. Listen, most of you, this is poo-hoo, you don't care. Listen, I understand that. But I'm telling you that if you do, you should be aware of that power of the Holy Spirit producing these fruit in your life. And until you learn that, you're not going to pay any attention to this great ministry that's over here to the spiritual Christian. This is where the dynamics of the life is for Christ. This is godliness. This is faith in a way that you could see mountains be moved. Okay. Well, I've hollered enough for one day. I know hollering doesn't make you understand it any better, but somehow in my mind I think it does, so there it is. <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer. The man will take the offering. For those who are visiting, this meal has been paid for. This is all about paying forward, not back. For those who understand the principle of grace giving, this is for us in our church. Let's have a word of prayer, Marion.